Right, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, today, I would like to share my thoughts and understanding about the COVID-19 disease in the form of uh, do's and don'ts. And now I have I taken this exercise. I'll tell you. Actually, as a consulting pulmonologist, I come across a lot of prescriptions which are too long, too irrational, and a lot of medicines written in them don't merit a place in a decent prescription. But why all this is happening? Maybe due to knowledge gaps or probably due to this confusing, ever-changing literature or as a matter of sheer desperation and eagerness to save a life by any means. But modern medicine stands up tall on the basic fundamental principle of nihil non nocere. That means do no harm. That is the fundamental principle. And at the same time, if you recollect the theme of Andhra Medical College, that is naked nemes. That means let there be no access. No access in the diagnostics, no access in therapeutics, no access in greed too. Anyway, let's practice the art of modern medicine as per the available evidence. And uh, my disclaimer, most of what I talk today is irrelevant to doctors abroad and mature doctors here. And uh, so systematically developed statements which act as a beacon and guide us in terms of diagnostics and treatments based on evidence. So let's do all that is possible derived from the, supported by the scientific data. As the evidence emerges, time to time we revise our guidelines as a living document. So let me walk through the do's and don'ts in various sections like diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccination and so on. Instead of, you know, any statement, if you can convert it into a do or it, it can be converted into a don't also, but let me brief in it. So initially, if the rapid antigen test is positive, it's positive only in 72% of the symptomatics and 58% of the asymptomatics. If it's positive, it's positive no, because it's highly specific, 95, 96%. But if it is negative, you have to go for an RT-PCR to confirm because RT-PCR is the gold standard. And even RT-PCR also, it's ideal to do it at a three to five day after the answer to the symptom. And if the RT-PCR is negative at the first instance, if you have a very high index of suspicion, you need to repeat it after three days or so. There are a lot of case reports, all India Institute of Medical Sciences and so many people have done repeatedly the RT-PCR is negative. Then they have done the ball and bronchial or lavage is positive. So there is a sensitivity issue. The sputum, it is around 63%, whereas ball, it is around 95%. So not that 63% means it is leaving out around 37%. So if it is negative, it doesn't mean that it is negative. You may need to repeat it if there is a high index of suspicion. And uh, don't try to prove the COVID negativity after the 14th day by doing a PCR. And a lot of people, once uh, even me in the beginning, when the RT-PCR is positive, I would like to ask, what is the CT number? That is a cycle threshold number. So the PCR, if it is, if the copies are generated in a less cycle number, we would think that the viral load is high. But in addition to the viral load, it is the basic immunological makeup of the individual, his immune footprint that decides what is happening. Because what I feel is it is not due to the viremia or virus that the patient is dying, but the host immune response, how he is mounting, that is the reason for the seriousness, the illness and death. If he is mounting a hyperimmune response, that is all causing this havoc. And again, 
I would suggest not to go for a CT scan. But if at all you do it, don't time it wrong. Doing it too early, a lot of people here out of anxiety, they go on day one or day two. May be there, may not be there, any shadow. And you know, 66% or two thirds of the asymptomatic people or even mildly symptomatic people, there's some change or the other in the CT, but they won't progress. So there's no need to take a CT. Okay, but if it is taken too early before five days, you'll be under this false sense of security that nothing is there or you are suffering from a minimal disease. And a lot of people call me up, Corad 5, it is serious. What shall I do, sir? See, Corad is nothing, but it is a you know, level of suspicion. If Corad 1 and 2, most probably they are non-tuberculous diseases, non-COVID diseases like tuberculosis or malignancy like that. And the suspicion grows as the Corad score four or five. Corad means how similar. Suppose a ground glass opacity, basal, subplural, peripheral, more suggestive of a COVID. So it is Corad five. Suppose if there is a cavity, upper lobe infiltrates, strain bud appearance, in the, that is suggestive of tuberculosis. So they classify it as a Corad one. That means not suggestive of COVID. So it's not seriousness, but it is a level of suspicion. Don't worry about it. And uh, for all practical purposes, I would suggest uh, doing a CT. A lot of people, you know, they repeat the CT. They monitor the disease with CT. Five days after a couple of weeks again and again like that. No need. So I would suggest in an acute setting, if the patient is worsening all of a sudden, probably with the suspicion of a pulmonary embolism or a pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum or a superimposed cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as there is a chance of myocardial injury in COVID, you can order it. But you know, even pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum and superimposed pulmonary edema can be diagnosed with a simple chest X-ray. And all the more a critically ill patient is really difficult to move him out of the ICU to the CT suit. So pulmonary embolism is the only indication which prompts me to take a CT, that's a contrast enhanced CT or CT pulmonary angiogram. Otherwise, in the chronic setting, see if the patient has stayed in the hospital for two weeks or three weeks, then he's deteriorating, he's having pneumonia. A consol I mean, pneumonia means a low bar consolidation, which is not typical of a COVID pneumonia or MPMOS or tuberculous lesions suspecting especially after tocilizumab. Tocilizumab, you know, is an immunosuppressant. So we should suspect all these things. And at that moment, I would order a CT. And another thing, after three weeks, if there is a resurgence of fever or cough or new infiltrates, which suggest BOOP, post-viral bronchitis, obliterans, I mean, pneumonia, bronchitis, obliterans, organizing pneumonia. So it also looks like subplural, basal, Wedge-shaped opacity is usually peribronchovascular and then a reverse halo sign or a at all sign. So in such cases, you can order a CT. And uh, if the patient is too dysnic just before discharge, is there any salvageable parenchyma or entirely fibrosis? We can caution the patient. We can show them that this is the residual fibrosis. Maybe it might take six weeks to three months to resolve or may not be resolving at all, but you need a home oxygen. At the same time, in the chronic setting, I would order to know any about tuberculosis or fungal diseases. So it is not the CT scores that uh, dictate the treatment modalities. So young people with uh, higher CT scores, like, you know, CT score is nothing but how much of lung is involved. So if it is 20 by 25 in a young, even then he's quite stable, but in an elderly person, if it is even by five by 25 also, he might be sick, hypoxic. And one thing I personally feel that if a score of five by 25, that means limited area is involved, but still he is hypoxic. I think there must be some vascular underlying problem like uh, segmental or uh, uh, <coughs> pulmonary embolism, because usually a lot of gas exchange area should be gone before hypoxia sets in. We have seen a number of cases. We see a lot of tuberculosis cases. Even one total lung is destroyed, but even then patient won't be hypoxic. But why this five by 25 should go hypoxic? Uh, I, have, I have thoughts that there could be underlying pulmonary embolism or a vascular phenomena. And uh, don't try to be a catalyst, a CT scan collector, just like a philatelist, you know? <clears throat> 
And don't forget that x-rays are still available for you. And uh, next, coming to the section of inflammatory markers. So a point observation of a CRP or a D dimer are they're not that useful. You have to monitor them in a time, time trend. And uh, after giving tocilizumab, never ever monitor with IL-6. You monitor with the CRP because IL-6 anyway will be elevated after giving tocilizumab because the receptors are blocked and free IL-6 will be available for measurement. It will be up to five days. Don't be in a panic that the next day IL-6 is elevated. So again, we'll give an another dose. Don't do that. And a lot of people here, they offer home samples. So laboratory technician will come home and collect the samples. So a lot of them will be false values. Don't get alarmed. And it, it should also be checked in terms of in the uh, light of age. Usually age into 10 would be the normal D-dimer. And uh, you should interpret, first of all, if a D-dimer value is available, is it in interpretable or any pre-analytic errors are there? Like, you know, whether you are using a 19 or 22 G needle or whether the tourniquet stays longer, more than three minutes, or is it been transported from home to the lab within one hour in a vertical position? And hemolysis is the big menace. If the hemolysis, if there is a lysis in the sample, the DDMS will be alarmingly, alarmingly elevated. And coming to the IL-6, IL-6 is also an inflammatory marker. But usually if you don't allow to clot, like using an EDTA, that's okay. But if it is allowed to clot, the longer the serum is in contact with the clot, the higher the IL-6 elevations and IL-6 varies with the room temperatures also. Coming to the therapeutics, I have n number of prescriptions I have gathered to keep it as a museum. You can see a normal individual uh, my asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic positive when they approach the practitioners. So these are all the kinds of prescriptions. You see steroid on day one, favipiravir, doxycycline, ivermectin, debigatron, zinc and other vitamins, acibrophilin, and uh, montelukas levocetrizine, oseltamivir, budamate, this is budicinide inhaler, pantoprazole. And in this prescription, mucinac, N-acetylcysteine. So, as I said, huge number of uh, prescriptions, a long list of, you know, they don't merit in the prescription actually, don't practice polypharmacy. This is an unfortunate 32 year old lady. I don't want to mention her name. Came for a second opinion. She's asymptomatic, but positive. Every day she visited her doctor. So every day these are the prescriptions written by him. Even injections. See, one of the shows the doxycycline and jostum. Jostum is cefaparazone. Two injections for that day. Next day he will change the prescription and he will give something else. So this is what you know annoyed me. And this made me to take up this lecture. So this is another prescription where favipiravir. So favipiravir is, you know, uh, fabiflu. A lot of pharmaceutical companies, they jumped in when the COVID was in their initial stages. They pushed up like favipiravir, a lot of trials. Uh, it reduces the viral load within five days and all these things. So whenever you, you know, want to use a drug or an intervention, what does it do? Our primary idea is whether it is reducing the mortality or whether it is reducing the morbidity or whether it is reducing the hospitalized duration and indirect costs, or at least whether it is preventing the individual to progress to serious interventions like invasive mechanical ventilation. If they're not doing anything, but they say it reduces the viral load, or it makes you better, or it makes you sing, I'm sorry, I don't want to endorse such prescriptions. So the favipiravir initially was designed for influenza and uh, Huge pill burden, you know, nine tablets in the morning, nine tablets in the evening, plus four, plus four for 13 days. So, and anyway, it uh, didn't work and we don't use. And coming to the do's and don'ts. Now, do's for mild, moderate, severe. See, 
treatment aspect only i'll come anyway you have to monitor all these people for hypoxia probably it's unlikely to, the saturation is unlikely to fall in the first five days but as the immune inflammatory phase sets in it falls so you have to follow in the, from the day six onwards and uh, paracetamol adequate hydration because temperature more than 100 degrees leads to insensible perspiration and uh, dehydration vitamin d vitamin d is it will boost the innate and adaptive immunity a lot of literature to support that even respiratory infections are very common in vitamin d deficient individuals all the more covid and certain some papers are there where it will interfere even with you know cytokine storm also vitamin c i learned from our previous speakers that uh, it enhances the dietary iron absorption which might lead to intracellular damage and myocarditis and uh, recently we too got monoclonal antibodies in india the imdevimab casirivimab of rosh or bamlanivab and ditsunivab of you know lllali <coughs> they can be used they are expensive to the tune of 60000 rupees but high risk individuals they shouldn't have hypoxia they should be mild illness only high risk like obesity bmi more than 35 is then is more than 65 comorbidities like ckd cld malignancies etc when they have a comorbid condition maybe to prevent the progression into serious illness they are advised coming to the moderate moderate and severe hypoxia as i said moderate means the saturation is less than 93% and severe the saturation is less than 90% here in addition to the regular medication of paracetamol hydration vitamin d and all the main sheet anchor is white steroid anticoagulation and oxygen so steroid as you know the largest recovery trial studied 11000 and odd subjects 6 mg of dexamethasone 6 am i audible dr sudhakar yes sir yes 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 you are okay, audible okay, okay. Okay. there is a little disturbance maybe from your end only because there is no other person who is speaking okay um, I, 6 mg of if i may recommend you may want to move right in front of your camera because uh, you are only using right perfect perfect okay thank you right 6 mg of dexamethasone uh, oral or iv interesting recommendation is it is for 10 days or until discharge whichever is earlier so if the discharge is on day 6 the recommendation says you should stop it on day 6 whichever is earlier so after 10 days there is no problem no no point in continuing i will tell you when we will use steroids after after 10 days also or later on and coming to the remdesivir in moderate illness the remdesivir you know act 1 trial said the oxygen is just falling it will reduce or it hastens the recovery from 15 days to 10 days whereas the act 2 to... paracetamol that uh, even on hfnvo and niv whereas remdesivir remdesivir is only for mild hypoxemia whereas those people who are on hfnvo and niv also this act 2 trial says this is good from the severe and paracet and coming to the severely hypoxic icu patients if there is worsening or increasing requirements of oxygen within 24 to 48 hours of starting the steroid there is a role for tocilizumab and tocilizumab again studied in several platforms like recovery trial remap cap trial or immunotoxicity trial so there is a marginal reduction in the mortality from 31% to 35 and the placebo it is 35% and the tocilizumab people they are less likely to go for a mechanical ventilation so survival advantage is also shown in the recovery trial and the remap cap trial and in the hospitalized patients anyway the prone position is practiced at all places and uh, monitoring in the hospital every 20 48 to 72 hours for crp d dimer in moderate and severe disease and hrct as i said in the beginning no need to take it unless there are warranting 
clinical conditions like pulmonary embolism or something else. So coming to the don'ts, antibiotics. I've gone through hundreds of prescriptions, OP prescriptions. Doxycycline, they used azithromycin, they used augmentin. So antibiotics, usually they don't find a place. Okay. Um, why? Because the bacterial co-infection in a COVID is only 6.9%. And in critically ill patients in ICU, it is only 8.1%. But if you see the prescriptions, the antibiotic prescription is to the tune of 71%. So a lot of overusage, it's a colossal waste of money. And I'm worried that India will be going in for a multi-drug resistant bug epidemic sooner than the later. So antibiotics in the mild disease and moderate disease, we don't prescribe. Steroids, we never prescribe in a mild disease. As I said, N-acetylcysteine, zinc, ivermectin, no role. Fabifiravir, Osaltamivir, magic remedies like Krishnapatnam, eye drops, they don't find any place. And anyway, plasma has fallen out of favor in all these three categories. So don't get tempted to use these monoclonal cocktails in moderate and severe disease. Actually, the manufacturers and this trials also, they tried in non-hypoxic patients only. So in the ICU, if after seven days, if the patient is running temperature and the uh, leukocyte count is elevated and uh, peripheral smear shows toxic granulations in bandemia, or if the gram stain is showing something, or a culture is positive, or at least procalcitonin, though it is for de-escalation, I, I use it. And then probably a good antibiotic can be used depending on the culture. Here also, there is no role for monoclonal antibodies. A lot of hospitals, the doctors used bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is an anti-cancer drug we use in non-small cell lung cancer, especially adenocarcinoma, which is actually a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. So there will be a lot of bleeding, intracranial hemoptysis, or even hemorrhagic ARDS. Don't use that. And coming to the ICU, you monitor the temperatures. If the temperatures are high with fevers and chills and rigors later on, probably indicate a cytokine storm. You should also monitor the saturation. And if there is a fall in BP, so hypovolemia, pulmonary embolism, or cardiac failure and myocardial injury. And recently, the critical care group of India, I'm a member of that, it, the, the critical care doctors are mentioning all of a sudden good stable patients are suddenly collapsing with the fall in BP that's refractory. So finally, the discussion was going on and they said it could be an, a, a, you know, infarct in the brainstem vasomotor area. That is the reason why it's becoming a refractory, hypo, I mean, a shock. And uh, not only you monitor the oxygen saturation, you look at the patient you know, if the patient's stachypnea, altered sensorium, and, you know, um, you can see hmm, anxious beads of sweat, his, all his accessory muscles are contracting, his, you know, impending respiratory failure. Hmm? So then probably you might go for an ABG to see his PCS CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels. Good glycemic control is mandatory, and you look at the urine output to identify the acute kidney injury early. And uh, routinely, you watch for the lower limbs for warmth, swelling, discoloration to see any DVT or an ischemic limb. And finally, if your uh, patient is not improving, at least in our setup, you just ensure to see whether whatever you have written in the chart is going in or there are missed doses. And finally, <clears throat> oxygen therapy, it's a lot of logistic burden. So, Always try to use nasal cannulas and face masks new for each patient. If not so, you can clean them with vinegar or soap or 10% hyperchlorite. You please use viral bacterial HME filters at the AMBU bag level and at the expiratory port of the ventilator to prevent aerosolization and to save the healthcare workers. So medical oxygen is to be used. And another point is, if you... Place a surgical mask over an acyl cannula or HFNC, that would be good to prevent the aerosolization. So medical oxygen is pure, 
it is prepared through repeated steps of compression filtration and purification but industrial oxygen is used for combustion cutting and usually it is with some oil so they grade it as oil less or oil free or uh, like that so even the cylinders are also not clean and contaminated so this is not for usually medical use and uh, dry oxygen whenever you give more than 4 liters of oxygen try to pass through humidifier otherwise there will be injury to the ciliary lining of the mucosa and the lungs and the secretions will be dried up insipicated difficult to expectorate and what water you are using i inquired the nurses so various answers came in but try to use distilled or filter water for humidifiers and coming to how much of oxygen i need to give always try to maintain 92 to 96% but in copd you can aim at 88% so less oxygen is also dangerous this you know liberal oxygen versus conservative oxygen therapy they tried a less oxygen of 88 to 92% the mortality is high because of mesenteric ischemia so also higher targets like more than 96 one uh, you know <clears throat> meta analysis iota meta analysis improving oxygen therapy in acute illness where hyperoxia leads to oxidative stress damage absorption atelectasis acute lung injury cns toxicity cerebral and uh, coronary venous i mean uh, coronary vasoconstriction so liquid name is let there be no excess so nothing less nothing more everything is in moderation that is the mantra of life anyway coming to the ventilatory care you try nf hfno and nav before embarking on an intubation if there is a real indication if the patient is struggling and not improving with this definitely you have to do an intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation where the ppe <coughs> protect yourself protect others and when is a patient is on a mechanical ventilation closed suction is important to avoid dispersion or aerosolization keeping the basic principles of mechanical ventilation like low tidal volume ventilation of 6 ml per kg and keep the plateau always under 30 cm of h2o and uh, peep you know gatinone is l type and h type some are good compliant lungs and some are bad compliant lungs for good compliant lungs you can use peep at around 8 to 10 and bad compliant lungs probably 10 to 15 not more than that lot of standard textbooks say uh, beyond 15 cm of h2o peep the benefit is offset but ards network trial says you can go as high as up to 24 but uh, you know indian chest as i said are small you should be careful and avoid secondary infection and coming to the steroids don't mix dexamethasone and methylprednisolone because things are being done i am telling you and don't dilute steroid in the morning and save the remaining half to the night dose sterility maintenance is real difficult in a pre diluted one and you know a lot of people got a habit of you know just like car driving and changing gears afternoon if the patient is not improving they just dump a bolus dose of 500 mg of solimedrol don't do that ards is a disease which follows its own timeline first week is exudative phase second week is proliferative stage third week and fourth week are fibrotic so you be patient and let the drugs act in their own time and don't prescribe the steroids routinely after discharge except for what i said bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia or the patient is previously on steroids for other indications like connective tissue diseases or an addison's disease and you know dexamethasone recently i i read a half life is you know 36 to 72 hours so it can auto taper so if you stop it today it can auto taper the next ensuing 3 days so this is a prescription where medrol was prescribed for four weeks after discharge in a normal patient perfenidone mucinac so today my talk's primary idea is to avoid all the drugs which are not having any evidence and they may do more harm than good and coming to the steroids this is a <clears throat> meta analysis which comprises of you know seven Uh, studies with various steroids like dexamethasone hydrocortisone methylprednisolone all the steroids favored out i mean studies favored the steroids the largest trial is recovery trial so they tried different strengths 20 mg intravenously 20 mg even uh, cape covid it tried hydrocortisone 200 mg so finally they zeroed in at the recovery trial the largest trial 6 mg orally 
intravenously. So several other steroids were also tried at various doses. And um, coming to the anticoagulants, as far as the hospitalization, as, far, as long as the patient is in the hospital, even in the wards or in the ICU, you have to prescribe anticoagulants. But once the patient is discharged, not every patient need to be prescribed anticoagulant. That we call it as post-discharge anticoagulation is extended thromboprophylaxis. I will tell you when you have to go for it. So the anticoagulation in the hospital is only prophylactic anticoagulation, that is 0 0.5 milligrams of clexan per kg per day OD, not therapeutic dose. Therapeutic is BD or even 1 mg per kg clexan. Therapeutic is reserved only for documented PE and pulmonary embolism and DVTs. And American Society of Hematology classified the diseases as critically ill and acutely ill. You critically ill or in ICU needing supports, ventilation or cardiovascular support, acutely ill people, they're in the wards, not in ICUs. So the prophylaxis, recommendation one, it is only prophylaxis over intermediate or therapeutic intensity. So high doses are not required, that's what is there. Even in critical illness, even in normal ward cases also, it is only prophylactic. So this is for acute illness. So coming to the discharge prescription of anticoagulants, so not everybody needs anticoagulation after discharge. This is one improved you know, VTE score where uh, prior history of thromboembolism, thrombophilia, lower limb paralysis, current malignancy, immobilization for at least seven days, ICU admission or age more than 60 days, or D-dimer into two times the upper limit of normal. This is actually a modified improved score. Normal improved score, the D-dimer is not there. If the score is more than four, you can go for an extended thromboprophylaxis at home, probably <clears throat> by pres prescribing a, you know, a pixaban or rivaroxaban direct factor 10 inhibitors. And uh, these are same repetitions. Don't prescribe steroids routinely at discharge. Don't, don't forget to advise glucose monitoring at home. And don't prescribe anticoagulants routinely. Don't practice polypharmacy, even discharge prescriptions. Tell them they may need home oxygen for if it is less than 88% because of fibrosis. And warn them at the time of discharge that there is a possibility of MESA, multi-system inflammatory syndrome adult, which is mostly extrapulmonary with hepatitis, encephalitis, or you know, <clears throat> thrombocytopenia, a lot of you know, acute kidney injury, myocardial injury, and all. So we should be very watchful about it. Even the doctor should be watchful about the post-PACS. Normally, first four weeks, we call it as acute COVID, and four to 12 weeks is post-acute COVID syndrome, and after 12 weeks is chronic COVID. But as previous lectures, Dr. Chilumari has said, we should be watchful about cardiac, diabetes, and psychiatric vigilance is a must. And a uh, lot of people, they write colchicine. So colchicine is an NLRP3 inhibitor. So still it is in clinical trials. If you prescribe, you prescribe within the purview of a clinical trial. So call corona trial, where the 30-day hospitalization or death, 4.7% in colchicine group and 5.8% in the placebo, no great change. Recovery trial also studied colchicine and the mortality in colchicine group is 19% and a placebo it is 20%. And again, another drug, perfenidone and intadanib. So these are antifibrotic agents. Normally we prescribe them in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And even now we are trying an intadanib in uh, connective tissue disease related fibrosis, especially the progressive systemic sclerosis. But here the one point is, these things are useful in progressive fibrosis. The progressive fibrosis is the hallmark of IPF. But here, the fibrosis is post-inflammatory. It is not progressive. So whether they find a place or not, only time will tell, and there are a lot of trials. The PGI Chandigarh is doing a pincer trial about the perfenidine. If you prescribe, you prescribe it within the purview of a clinical trial. Last year, in the first wave, I have prescribed nintadanib for around 30 people. They have improved. But I don't know whether they improved over time or with perfenidone, because a lot of people without nintadanib also, they improved. So I don't know whether the interdanib worked or not. So the trial will tell us what would happen with an interdanib. And do continue ARBs and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, clopidogrel and aspirin. 
And if you prescribe epixaban and rivaroxaban, till then you drop aspirin. And finally, coming to the vaccination, now the government of India has given a directive only after 90 days of the infection, you have to undergo the vaccination of the infection. Even after vaccination also, people need not feel like great bahubalis. They should adopt the COVID appropriate behavior. A lot of people ask me, is it Covaxin or Covishield? Which shall I take? See, anything that comes to you, you take it. The goal is to get immunized. See, my comparison is you can reach New York either by Air India or Emirates or American Airlines. Only the comfort probably differs. Any vaccine is okay. And finally, which vaccine-induced thrombocytopenic purpura, thrombocyte, thrombotic thrombocytopenia akin to HIT, recent New England Journal of Medicine has given a beautiful article of 11 WIT cases. Each case report is wonderful how they're presented, how they're managed. You know, though it is rare, you should be aware of this. AstraZeneca, one pair, you know, roughly one lakh, and Janssen and Janssen, six cases per six million, though rare. Especially in 35 to 52 year old females, the central sinus thrombosis presenting as headache or focal neurological deficits or altered sensory. And the case reports, they said hepatic vein thrombosis, mesenteric vein thrombosis. They presented as a backache in hazygous and hemiazygous thrombosis also. And the thing is, whenever we find a clot, say central sinus thrombosis or anywhere, we tend to give heparin. You shouldn't give heparin because it is just like a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and anti-platelet factor four antibodies are there. It will bleed further and patient will die. So the treatment is steroids, methylprednisolone, one milligram per kg, or IVIG, one, one gram per kg for two days, daltiparin or fondaparin. Of course, the factor 10 inhibitors like argatroban can be given. And this is relevant to our people. So don't curse me, but what I have observed, I am putting here. So don't yield to pressures while prescribing the drugs, either a power or political pressures while prescribing remdesivir or atocilizumab. So they have clear cut clinical indications rather than power or political indications. Don't yield to magic remedies and don't reprimand your juniors or staff in front of the patients all the more. Never reprimand at all. You teach them. If you find lacuna, you find them out. What is the problem? And you try to correct them. And at the same time, you do counseling to these patients to quit smoking and alcohol and they will follow if they are alive. Because it is the right time. Hit the nail when it is hot. Have a compassionate talk to the patients, patients' attendants, especially the legally authorized respondent who is an attendant. You should never speak them rudely. Why the doctors are being trashed? Probably we were not taught how to communicate. There should be a classes for communication and breaking the bad news. In Oxford's textbook of medicine, a chapter is there for breaking the bad news, how to break the bad news when even they will give wipes to wipe the tears. Huh? The patient's attendance will be seated comfortably in a room. So acquaint yourself and then even uh, you can give, offer them coffee, wipes and all. Then you have uh, ascertain whether the children have come from schools or not. After that only they have, they will have a breaking, they, they will break the bad news. But anyway, huge caseload. It is, you know, quite unbecoming on my part if I demand all these things, but there should be a communication cell. <clears throat> and Dr. Sudhakar asked me to include the recent guidelines. Uh, three to five days ago, the government of India directed General of Health Services issued this. So in summary, what all we spoke that is mentioned. So nothing more. And uh, the only change what they made, I'll tell you. Uh, it's an algorithmic model where they have included asymptomatic group and mild group. And they have advised a six minute walking test to unearth the occult hypoxemia. And they are advised to get admitted into a COVID care center for observation of hypox. But I have my own reservations here. Unsupervised six minute walk test might precipitate myocardial injury. <clears throat> so I don't uh, agree with this. There are a lot of papers Six minutes walk test might be reduced to three minutes walk test or five minute walk, I mean test and five sit to stand test, five times STST, sit to stand test. Or another important relevant thing is 40 on the spot step test. You trample there on the spot 40 times. Uh, chair beside, if you are feeling giddiness or any reeling sensation, you can sit there. That is a 40 on the spot 
you know steps test anyway the government has prescribed 6 minute walk test for these two and i think we have to follow and rest of all are same only prophylactic anticoagulation and in, in, interestingly they have mentioned earlier we were all trying to prescribe tocilizumab and il6 now actually i have observed no trial even recovery trial mentioned if the crp is more than 75 you have to uh, prescribe tocilizumab and the to, uh, corimina or tosi it has subgroup analysis more than 150 <clears throat> per deciliter of crp had uh better impact with tocilizumab so they are all doing it with crp the government of india today has uh, prescribed uh, when the crp is more than 75 mg per uh, per liter not deciliter uh, you can prescribe tocilizumab if there is a increasing recent oxygen requirements within 24 to 48 hours and, and lord <coughs> krishna he dispels the myths demystifies arjuna's fears and apprehensions in the battle of kurukshetra and the bhagavad gita the chapter 2 is a sankhya yoga where karmanyeva adhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phala hetur buhu ma te sangotsva karmane ma means don't akarmani means not resorting to do anything so we shouldn't re- resort to akarmanyatvam akarmanyatvam means not doing anything so you have a right to perform your prescribed duty but you are not entitled to the fruits nor you be held responsible for the results of your activities at the same time the lord said never be attached to not doing your duty so do your duty whatever because why i said this is uh, surrounded by the confusion of all this do's and don'ts <clears throat> if you stop doing something that's not good do whatever that is that is in the best interest of the patient and um, in the end again i will end this with this note to remind you that the modern medicine is standing tall on the pedestal of nihil non nocir do no harm and uh, thank you very much for the patient listening thank you sir Dr. Kairam, please unmute yourself. I am not listening to you. Dr. Kairam, I am not yeah, listening to you. Sorry about that. Sorry about oh, that. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, I, I was just saying that thank you very much. That was a nice roundup. And in your own inimitable style of do's and don'ts, uh, supported by science and guidelines, etc., so it's a matter of challenge to the people like dr sudhakar and the leaders how to get that message across to the practitioners the truth is that many of these guidelines have been known for the last 3 or 4 weeks and some of those prescriptions that you show are emblematic of not following guidelines so dr sudhakar the challenge is up to you how you could transmit all of the stuff that we have heard in the last 30 days summarized by kulkarni last night or prem kumar tonight how do we get it to the masses of the practicing doctors so you have work to do while you are doing that work i want to remind you of the last slide that he put up there take care of yourself you look like you lost weight and you don't look good don't be afraid <laughs> i have might call your yeah. wife you don't behave so i think you are sort of stressed out so please take care of yourself so we'll now go to the chat box and uh, actually i would say i am still learning in my last lecture i put up a slide showing a slate with uh, us the alphabets of uh, telugu so i'm still learning so i invite dr chilmuri prasad malampalli dr budharazu and all other um, um previous speakers are our renowned expert panel to join me in answering all the charts probably may or may not 
answer them all. Thank you. One of the first questions that came up today, Dr. Prem Kumar, was uh, Dr. Sudhakar might address this. Rapid antigen test is not being accepted by Aurogusri. Um, government bodies are only accepting RT-PCR. I would not know about this. Is this an issue, Dr. Sudhakar? Uh, yes. Uh, right now, before, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah before, right now, uh, the... Government of India, uh, sir, please, please. Yeah. Uh, before I comment on that, uh, many thanks to Dr. Prem Kumar for an excellent uh, overview of what all uh, we have learned, learned so far. And the answer to Dr. Karam's question with regards to uh, the advocacy of this particular do's and don'ts to the masses and uh, promote so to our colleagues is that's the reason why we have been doing all this regularly. And from the expert dust that you have created one month ago, I'm sure that uh, through this expert dust, people have learned enough. And uh, what has been done today is wrap up the entire, um, uh, all the presentations. And I'm sure that people would uh, live up to the expectations of this particular uh, expert dust. And um, they prescribe more ration rationally from now onwards. That is one. Uh, regarding this RAT, rapid antigen test. So the ICMR guidelines, those they say that there are no, uh, it's not required to do an RT-PCR once the, uh, the rapid test is positive. And if rapid test is negative and an individual is symptomatic, then one should go for RT-PCR. Ideally, they should have accepted this at the Aurogishri, but Prem Kumar being in the expert panel of the state perhaps can give, a, uh, give them an advice to accept this rapid antigen test also because the ID is generated for that also. That's also uh, there in the, in the uh, ICMR website and uh, ICMR um, is accepting that as a test so we have to make our state government to accept the rapid test also as a positive test instead of going for the RT-PCR if it is positive and thereby reducing the load on the lab as well. So probably being in the expert committee, he can suggest that to the government. Uh, your thoughts, sir, Dr. Prem Kumar? Yes, sir. Actually... The government of India is issuing the circulars time to time and actually ICMR is doing that. Initially, they said only RT-PCR and then they issued, uh, you know, a rapid antigen tests. And finally, recently they issued home rapid antigen test kits. They approved it. Actually, the home rapid antigen test kits uh, produced by Mylan. Even you can do at home and you can take a picture of it. And actually, initially we have to you know, download an app that is given by the ICMR and you take the picture of the rapid antigen test result, the mark that will be uploaded, uploaded to the ICMR. So uh, that is now in place, actually, even home rapid antigen tests are also allowed. But, you know, that will be uploaded and the ICMR will inform the concerned authorities about your uh, follow. -up. That's what, but as you said, the Arugisri must have accepted the uh, rapid antigen test positivity also for uh, reimbursement of money. I will, I will talk to the CEO of, you know, Aragisri and actually I'll put it in the committee, expert committee tonight. And uh, once we come with a conclusion, I think we can ask the uh, CEO of Aragisri about that. Thank you. Dr. Uday Kumar is asking, in spite of all these rigid protocols followed, what is the cause for mortality especially in young patients. Uh, sometime earlier today, this came up. Is it true, first of all, that the mortality rate is higher in the younger ones in this way? Or is this a general question that uh, even young people, why are they dying? So I'm, I may not be reading it correctly. Dr. Chilimuri also might have a comment. Dr. Prem Kumar, do you think yeah. something uh, different is happening with young people? Well, um, what the mortality depends upon is how soon, how early 
the patient is presenting to the facility so are they missing it are they missing the early warning signs and usually young people are very complacent about they are young and they are healthy and they can withstand anything that's why usually they feel the symptoms or they just brush them aside and probably they don't monitor and a lot of people nowadays they are not presented even with fever just a feeling of listlessness or lethargy or malaise they are not take, i mean uh, taking it as a symptom so by the time they are hypoxic then only they are identifying so they are reaching the um hospital little late that is one and second thing the mortality always depends upon the healthcare system huge workload are the medicines or the care is really going on to each and every one all the times that's another thing and uh, patients individual host immune response a robust young individual if he mounts a hyperimmune response hyperinflammatory syndrome then probably there is chance for going in for multi system organ failure and uh, die now see 80% of the population are mild why why only 15% hospitalized and why only 5% are going into icu because their immune system dictates so they will mount a hyperimmune response which goes unchecked leading to cytokine release syndrome and multi organ failure probably dr chilimuri can add to it um i think the question is if uh, if if you're following the protocols rigorously why do some people die i think it's not an age question um so why do some people die where you did everything correctly gave the steroids on time oxygen on time control the diabetes whatever um the belief is that there are somewhere between 8 to 10% of people who have intrinsic immune defects um and one of them is the, either the presence of interferon antibodies which we started uh, looking for but we don't have patients to search for and the second is uh, actually intrinsic defects in the production of interferon 1 um there is now increasing evidence um, and in fact new drugs are also being developed to show that if you have those two defects this virus is lethal no matter what you do uh, there's a very high death rate in them even when people have no risk factors um it is likely that uh, when you done everything correctly some people will die and uh, it's presumed that they have an intrinsic uh, immune defect that we didn't know of unfortunately these defects uh, don't cause any other disease for us to recognize early uh, this is the first virus that we know of which actually exploits that weakness in the immune system we don't know of any other is so i would assume that's the case um the previous uh, do young people have higher mortality absolutely not there is no evidence whatsoever that young people uh, yes they could uh, produce more uh, robust uh, interferon uh, sorry uh, cytokine response but by and large if you take a vast number of kids who got infected or adolescents who are infected uh, their death rate is uh, very low um, i don't think they die doctor uh, well i'm going to leave it at that we may have to come back because i see 15 messages in the chat box dr deepthi is asking therapeutic anticoagulation is only for pulmonary embolism but how do we know that in resource poor settings how many patients have ct angio can we go by very high d dimers like 2000 plus or very significant o2 requirement with not so bad chest uh, less than 50% score that's a good question dr prem yes sir and uh, actually i told you uh, if the ct scores are very less the area involved in the ct is very less but patient is extremely hypoxic and uh, in such case i suspect a vascular problem and anyway if a patient is deteriorating if your uh, ct angio is not available at least i think a bedside ultrasound point of care ultrasound is available where you can look at a you know two d echo where there is a right ventricular dilatation the septal shift to the left side and you know if the keep the high frequency probe at the femoral or popliteal you may have a non compressible gray round clot you can suspect but anyway all these guidelines are made in institutions uh, so 
critically ill icu people and all and uh, if we follow the guidelines uh, we can't go beyond them that if there is no documented pe or uh, you know dvt we can't go for a therapeutic anticoagulation dr silmuri can you add anything silmuri when yeah. things are very bad for you when you did i agree uh, i think uh, so i think it's a good question uh, since you have large number of patients who are sick all over the country how do you manage it um i would uh, have no problem giving firstly i want to suggest that these large pees happen only in the first four weeks of the illness uh, they are uncommon beyond uh, four to six weeks of illness so if you're seeing this in six weeks after the onset of illness it's probably something else i i would think it's mostly heart failure more likely it's heart failure than Um, but if you, I I wouldn't treat based on D dimers, but I have no problem in the right setting. Uh, within four weeks of onset of symptoms, um, you have hypoxia that you cannot explain, um, and I'm assuming your physical exam doesn't point towards right heart failure. It should because you're really concerned about large PEs because uh, subsegmental PEs are fairly common in most sick patients, including COVID, and they don't cause mortality. um not so i would treat uh, based on this particular example where you gave you gave high amount of oxygen um and you are unable to oxygenate and your chest x ray uh, or cat scan looks normal you're saying or i'm assuming chest x ray is normal um so i'll i'll caution you uh, we just did an abstract uh, where we saw patients whose chest x rays were nearly normal uh but the cat scans were really abnormal and all they had was covid and didn't have pulmonary embolism um so just want to uh, be careful about that uh, but if you can tell me there's some right heart pressure that you can examine and uh, by auscultation alone loud p2 or something like that uh, i would not have a problem if you give anticoagulation um even though i said there are 13 messages in the chat box i just reviewed 12 of them dr prem were congratulating and thanking you for a beautiful talk that takes me to dr chilmuri for the repeating uh, stressing on what you said about yeah. the most important aspect of care talking to patients and family yeah see, see there during the acute terrible time last year you may not have done very well with families but you must have now developed the models of how the residents and the attending talk to patients yeah um, even during the acute phase uh, this was a part of what we think so uh, just so uh, i think you raise a very important point about talking to patients here's what happens when you really sick and having seen them personally uh, many of them when they're really ill um, the pa- if you are a patient you will first of all will be very isolated you have nobody to talk to everybody avoids you like like the plague uh, because they are told not to touch you off and they're told not to contact with you because they might end up getting infection so you really taking a very sick individual and isolating them completely from the rest of the world um so and they've already come out of a one year of uh, lockdowns and pandemic so mentally they're not really ready for anything and they've already heard large number of people dying from the illness and there they are sitting at home in the hospital all by themselves so the conversation that i had and i did this maybe hundreds of time myself uh, with uh, many patients uh, along with uh, doctors who were sick and nurses who were sick um it doesn't take that long but i think what you want to talk to the patient this is how i do it and i'm just giving it quickly i asked them to they believe in god and uh, uh, fortunately most people do believe in god um then i asked them what's the most important thing for you why do you want to live and often they'll tell you well i want my kids to go to college or i want to see my daughter get married or some clearly uh, defined goals they have in their lives and i bring that out and i said i think you and i will work on it uh, this is where your symptoms are this is what your disease is and we're going to give you the following we'll give you oxygen steroids whatever and it does work in a lot of 
people, but you need to fight with us. One is, uh, and remember who you're fighting for and who's with you. Uh, I'll tell God is with you and, uh, and you are fighting to stay alive so you can see your daughter get married or whatever the stated in, uh, target uh, objectives in life are. And then I ask them for their cooperation about proning as much as they can because we like them to prone and uh, patients don't like proning. So that also encourages them. And I reinforce this, that you're fighting not just for you, but you're fighting for those that are important for you in life. Um, and we are with you together and we'll take you through. And I point out of how many people have gotten better and then went back to their families. And I don't talk about death or uh, that they may not do well. That's not a conversation I want to have with them. And I find this takes about 10, 15 minutes after you practice a few times. First time, maybe it took 20 minutes, but after that 10 minutes, and I've seen visibly people, um, uh, you know, c come together with it. Uh, they feel like I've, I've seen some way I've touched them and gave them the positive frame of mind that they need to fight for. Um, I've known many doctors uh, who gotten better that I've taken care of them. And two, three months later, they all remember of all the care that they received in the hospital. They tell me that's one conversation that remember and that's their turning point. But somebody sat with them and had that conversation, identified what the goals in life are and why they should fight for. And I think that's why I frame, that was wonderful. You put that in your last slide. I think this is 30% of the care that you would give. I don't think steroids and oxygen alone will save a person's life unless that person has that mindset to fight and wants to live. Uh, for some reason, this virus plays with your brain and keeps telling you to give up and you need to encourage people to fight and fight and fight and they will survive. I believe in it and I hope uh, you will have these conversations with you. Thank you. Uh, to go back to the questions, Dr. Uh, Prem Kumar, you might have already addressed the repeat RT-PCR and latest high-resolution CT, but Dr. Vijay Sekhar is asking in the context of surgery. Just before going to surgery, do we have to do this? Is that what you're saying, Vijay Sekhar? Yes, sir. Yes. Of late, because every time we are having the surgeons are uh, having a uh, dialogue with anesthetists, sir. They are repeatedly insisting for a latest RT-PCR, especially like a flight protocol, just uh, before five days or seven days of the proposed surgery. Also asking for the HRCT, also asking for sometimes the pulmonary function tests, which are practically not available in our hospital. Patient need to be shifted outside for these tests. Uh, so what uh, are they really mandatory, number one. Number two, uh, for how long, suppose the patient has subsided, uh, survived post-COVID mucor, uh, how many days this RTPCR can be positive? Dr. <coughs> Vijay Shekhar, you have asked, but you know, if it is a COVID positive, the RTPCR positive, and there is an emergency brain surgery, like, you know, road traffic accident, you need to do an extra dural hemorrhage or something else. If it is positive, do, won't we do that? If an emergency seizure, won't we do that? If it is an RTPCR positive, polytrauma, RTPCR positive, won't we do that? So it is not mandatory to do an RTPCR or to identify the disease much early, getting a CT. And in the CT, if there is a mild ground glass, it is, you know, COVID, I don't do that. See, just like HIV, we have to exercise universal precautions. And probably if you want, there should be a separate theater. If the results are not available or inconclusive, one thing, the doctors, anesthetists, surgeons, other staff nurses, they should be in a PPE to do that if the results are not available or if you are suspecting it. But we cannot say no, if it, even if it is an RTPC positive. That's what I would like to say. No, exactly. That is what I'm uh, emphasizing to say. We are doing, the surgeons are coming to the front. Most of the times, uh, the, the asking of these tests are by anesthetists. Uh, and uh, even, uh, so, uh, just imagine, 
for all the mucor cases the end surgeons are up and uh, rather even the neurosurgeon we are operating through endoscope the actual area of uh, where the maximum viral load is the nasal pharynx through the uh, sinuses only we are uh, dealing when the surgeons are not fearing it is only delaying the uh, posting for surgery patient waiting is becoming more and more for the surgeries that is my uh, main concern so for how long this rt pcr is there is there any I, I don't know if the, there is uh, any anesthesiologist here. Ah, plus guidelines of uh, you know. Naturally, if the patient is deteriorating, to put in a mechanical ventilator also, we, they have to intubate. And if it's a serious case, they have to operate upon. They have to intubate, even if it is an RT-PCR positive. So I don't know why are the reservations. Any anesthesia guidelines? I don't know any anesthetist here to say no to an emergency surgery, even if it is RT-PCR positive. Doctor Sridhar, please go ahead. Yeah, so for emergency, as you pointed out, there's no reason to do any testing. You should go ahead and do what needs to be done. If the, if you don't know the patient's COVID status, then the surgeons, the anesthesiologist, whoever is in the operating room, has to wear full PPE. That's the recommendation. I think for elective surgery, if you're still performing them, the American Board of Surgery wanted this five days prior to surgery. Uh, to minimize the risk for personnel in elective surgery, so that's where I, the five-day thing came from. Um, CDC recently has rescinded that, so because we've done a lot of this, as you said in India, delays cases, um, it didn't really save any patients. So this is more or less out. Now, um, high-resolution CT absolutely not indicated. I think the only thing you want to look at a patient is it baseline hypoxia or not. Even if the patient is not COVID, uh, high-resolution CT routinely as perioperative test has never been indicated. Um, so that's not uh, recommended even outside of the COVID. Um, uh, we run perioperative clinics uh, and uh, medicine, and we do not do that. It's never recommended. You can check it. I, I think on the other hand, all you have to do is look at uh, a normal evaluation. If the patient is not hypoxic, you don't need any tests. Uh, and if the patient has underlying COPD, you will tell the patient that is the risk ahead of time, but a risk that you can't alter. Even if you do PFTs, even if you do CT, that's not going to change anything. That complication that's going to happen will happen. Nobody has reversed COPD. So... You just monitor them more carefully after surgery. That's about what you can do. Um, so don't do CAT scans uh, and PFTs. Not recommended. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sridhar. And uh, yeah. similarly, a word on PFT pulmonary function tests for these patients, any role? Not recommended at all. Not recommended uh, at all. Thank uh, you. We've not seen any value. And uh, remember, if you are in a high... Uh, infection area, who will do PFTs? It's very high risk for the respiratory therapist who's doing. Um, even in low risk areas, we're still not ready to do PFTs on uh, patients right now because you know, uh, you're blowing into things and uh, you can easily transmit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I could get into trouble for saying this. I could understand the surgeons asking for it. I did not understand why the anesthetists are asking for it. I'm surprised. It uh, is actually yes. anesthesia who lasts for it. <laughs> but knowing what this disease is like, this patient has already recovered. He has mucor. He needs surgery. But we are already into third week or fourth week. Yeah, you have to do it. There is no reason to do CT and PFTs. Right. Absolutely. It's a medical emergency. Yeah. So for both of you, Dr. Prem, the next three questions are combined. After you've recovered from COVID, when do you exercise? When do you begin exercising? What kind of exercise maybe and for how long? See, after <clears throat> discharge, see after 10 days of discharge or once you are out of the hospital, you can take a light walk, stroll and all. But you know, you should remember about MESA, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, adult, which can happen up to 12 weeks. So up to 12 weeks means roughly three months. My Personal advice is not to take a uh, vigorous exercise, uh, like going to gym, lifting the weights and all, but you know, light walking is advised. Anything to add, Dr. Sridhar? Yeah, I agree. That's what I would do. I think you also want to evaluate the, the existing risk factors. If somebody has diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease, 
recovers from COVID, uh, you want to take it really slow. I think uh, if they have no risk factors and get better um, four weeks after COVID, I would say you can, you probably are out of the multi-inflammatory syndrome window. Uh, you could slowly increase your, uh, yeah, light exercise followed by whatever they normally do. If you have underlying risk factors of hypertension, diabetes, and and heart disease, you really have to take it. Uh, don't push it. Not so much as lifting weights and running. What about breathing exercises? I think I would recommend them from day one. As soon as you discharge, breathing exercises are very good to do. I think because um, if the the uh, lungs, basically the peripheral of the lungs are collapsed uh, in COVID. So you want to expand them out as quickly as you can. So breathing exercises and yoga and all that would be fine. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Pudrazu. Yeah, on uh, Dr. Uday Kumar's question about the mortality among uh, uh, younger people, especially in 30s and 40s, which has happened quite a bit in this uh, particular surge in India. You know, part of that might be other risk factors, not just the age part of it, but there's a lot of obesity um, in um, um, uh, middle-aged India now between 30s and 50s. As a lot of the BMIs, I think on average, are well above 30 or 35. Um, even in US and Western countries, the second surge has happened in somewhat younger people. The common denominator, I think, was high BMI, diabetes. Um, in fact, in our hospital, the average BMI of a COVID patient now is probably about 40. Um, um, so I think that might uh, you know, be an issue in India where we're seeing young people in 30s and 40s, um, you know, getting really sick. I think BMI is probably the most important factor there. As far as um, um, the, the guidelines for, um, you know, perioperative screening for COVID, I think in India, it's going to be really difficult. I mean, even screening patient attendants, journalists who walk straight into the ward, um, you know, even healthcare providers are not, not asked to routine screening questions like, did you have a fever? Did you have any upper respiratory symptoms? In the U.S., based on CDC guidelines and OSHA guidelines, we started um, pretty much every healthcare institution started, uh, you know, very rigorous screening right from the front gate um, for everybody, including healthcare providers. So I think uh, that is probably more uh, important than... Um, you know, try doing RT-PCRs on every elective um, emergency surgery. Uh, that's for Dr. Shaker's question. Okay. Uh, another question, duration of anticoagulation for segmental pulmonary embolism after discharge in COVID patients. Not routine anticoagulation, but patient if already a, has- Yeah, if a patient has a documented PE we follow the American chest physician guidelines three to six months uh, is what the guidelines would be if it was a first documented uh, episode of VTE. If this is a second or third event in their life, then you know extended or indefinite anticoagulation is what is recommended by ACP and American Society of Hematology. It may not be directly related. There's a question here regarding hypothyroidism screening. Is it necessary or not? And what about tropical eosinophilia role in COVID? I suppose it means if somebody already had tropical eosinophilia. Yes? So generally we believe eosinophilia is actually protective. So, um, so we've, um, we've been looking for patients who have high eosinophil count, uh, whether they get COVID number one, and if they get it, is it uh, severe? And what we found is that when you have severe COVID, you actually, all your isnophils disappear. So when you, when you have profound isnophilia, actually your isnophil count will go to zero uh, in most patients who have severe COVID. And the reverse is the truth. So people who have high isnophil count um, either don't get COVID or have very mild COVID. That's our experience. So I, and we believe that's because a high isnophil count attacks the, the virus itself because it is a, is the field response that the virus avoids as much as possible. That's why it suppresses it. 
Um, so I think proper calistophilia should not be a particular problem with COVID. Um, in terms of thyroid function tests, I don't think you'd routinely need to do it because it's a very small percentage of people who get autoimmune thyroiditis. At that point, if you suspect it, you could look for it, but not routinely. I think the uh, less the better. Um, and if the eosinophilia is eosinophilia is more like probably they might be diagnosing it as a tropical pulmonary eosinophilia there are certain criteria but if eosinophilia is more and if the patient received larger doses of steroids i would keep in mind the disseminated strong allergies too in my mind because if they use it tosi or high doses of steroids initial yeah i th- i i absolutely agree um I don't want to give steroids at all unless they have uh, COVID and that in the second week. So uh, prophylactic steroids is uh, very dangerous, no matter what your situation. I agree. Just before I let ask Dr. Manvisar out to speak, uh, for anybody here that is not a regular listener, Mr. Tucker had a prize for the highest attendance that goes to Manvisar. He attended all 31 sessions. Dr. Malesh, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, I'm mid, April to mid, mid May, I've seen a lot of deaths, uh, innumerable. Uh, there are people, patients who are stable uh, with the low oxygen around uh, five liters, uh, maintaining well with the saturation of 95.96. Suddenly, they succumbed. The next day morning, when we, we I, asked, I talked to so many patients in the hospital while they're in the hospital. Uh, their saturation are measuring around 96, 97 with the four or five liters of oxygen. By the morning, they succumb. What could be the reason whether the pulmonary embolism or, uh, as you said, in the uh, infarction, the brainstem, or can we guess uh, by clinically any danger signs uh, who, who uh, they will uh, succumb like that? Actually, that's what I said. Sudden deaths, we should count on pulmonary embolism and uh, large vessel strokes or, uh, you know, uh, just now uh, and a myocardial infarction or, uh, as I said, in the uh, CCI, the Critical Care Society of India, we were discussing about the brainstem infarcts leading to a vasomotor center involvement and a sudden collapse. Anything might be possible, but I don't know uh, to monitor this at home, how we do it. We can monitor oxygen, but we can't monitor this embolic phenomena or vascular phenomena. I don't know, Dr. Chilamuri can uh, throw more light on this. No, I I agree. I think uh, often you cover the uh, PE part well because you give uh, anticoagulants fairly regularly. Uh, what you're not covering so well is heart disease. I think uh, quite a number of them have a cardiogenic failure. They either develop acute heart failure or tremendous right heart failure and strokes. I, I think uh, the points you raised are, uh, and they're difficult to manage. That's the only thing you could do a little bit about is heart failure. Um, strokes are strokes. There's nothing once they happen, they're difficult to manage. Um, the thing that you do want to watch is medications that you're giving, make sure they don't cause cardiac toxicity. Uh, you know, often we give multiple medications without um, paying attention that they cause uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Even some antibiotics do that. Um, so as you adding medications, make sure that you delete medications you don't need. Uh, you know, there's a tendency as patients get sicker, we keep adding more and more. Um, and they all uh, end up giving you toxicity. So, so you don't want to cause the death of patients. And there are unknowns like the sudden heart failure and stroke that we can't really control as yet. But many we do see them people, collapse rapidly. Like that. Many young and robust, uh, strong patients succumb suddenly within three days, two days. They yeah. went walking and... Uh, uh, just like that, they admitted and they died within two, three days. It was shocking in the mid April to mid May. After that, uh, they are not so one of deaths. Yeah. I think those maybe, if they're walking and collapsing, I think we underestimate the severity of illness. That's what happened in those. Uh, what I was alluding to are patients in the hospital where they seem to be doing well and suddenly collapse. Um, that's what I'm talking about. Um, 
if people are walking outside and walking, talking, people suddenly collapsing, uh, that's because we uh, probably underestimated how sick they were. Uh, because I think the focus often is only on lungs and you're looking at hypoxia uh, and you may miss heart failure. Uh, it is fairly common, as I said, uh, um, heart failure due to either myocarditis or uh, ischemia is fairly common in COVID and uh, often missed. So I think when we're examining patients, uh, that's why I don't want them to be walking around until I'm absolutely sure they're better, completely better, four to six weeks out of COVID. So I don't want them to be walking, going up hills or running um, while they have COVID, even if it's mild. Um, and even after four weeks, I'll tell them, don't do anything um, it's vigorous until we are absolutely sure you are completely normal. Um, so that's how I view it. Just breathing exercises. Dr. Yeah. Udar Kumar was hoping to elicit a comment from Dr. Chakra Rao. Are you still there, sir? Dr. Udar Kumar, was it related to the mortality in the younger people or an anesthesia response? Anesthesia response, sir. Anesthesia response. How about Dr. Kormanath? Dr. Kormanath is also there. I want him to speak. All right, Doctor. Chakra has come, sir. Hello. Yes. This, this is this is Doctor Kurmanath, sir. Kalyapalli. Yes. Yes. Ah. Sir, uh, being in emergency, we have to give anesthesia. That is beyond doubt. It's when it is uh, it is mandatory also. Only thing, if the patient is stable, we can we have to evaluate the patients to exclude complications like uh, see you may get uh, intraoperative complications like pneumothorax. Those, for those things, we have to evaluate, if possible, if possible, I repeat, uh, like doing a chart CT test, while doing other, other uh, pre uh, tests like ECG and all, we have to do pulmonary function test and HRT if possible. But in the case of emergency, when they, when, it, when they are not available, we have to take all precautions, wearing your PPE kits, and we have to proceed. And uh, explaining the, all the compl possible complications to the patient and the attendants. That's all, sir. Thank you. Chakra Rao. Chakra Rao Garu. Unmute, sir. Unmute, sir. Unmute your microphone. Okay. Yes. okay. Actually, we do not uh, actually deny the uh, anesthesia for anybody, whether it is an emergency. So, but the thing is, at least. Uh, if you have some RT-PCR, <coughs> not RT-PCR, at least some antigen test, you will be more careful because you are thinking that uh, the surgeon is more uh, uh, affected than the anesthetist and all. It is not like that. The anesthetist will be coming more close to the uh, nose and uh, mouth when he is intubating and when there is an aerosol generation from the patient. So definitely we have, we need more protection. And if we know the status of the uh, individual or the patient, then we will be taking more care because we're, we cannot uh, rely upon the uh, things that are being supplied in the market, uh, even the masks and uh, the face shields and all those things. So definitely we need, because uh, we are getting, uh, different types of qualities and we cannot rely upon the things. And don't think that uh, how anesthesia is bothered about uh, uh, the welfare of the patient. It is not all the welfare of the patient. It is to protect ourselves from getting infected. So, and uh, in the post-operative period also, definitely we need, uh, we need more times of sections and all those things. Definitely, sometimes we assist the nurses in doing that. So definitely we need at least a, a minimum antigen test uh, before. And we know we, we, are, we have faced the uh, days, even we did surgery, even without uh, do, uh, doing uh, urine, almond and sugar. So now we have some facilities. So let us, let us not, uh, it, it is not for delaying tactics or delaying or postponing the things, it is only to add more protection to the people who are involved. Dr. Chakra, Dr. Chakra Garu, I, 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 I fully 
I fully agree with you and I honor the integrity of NSTs. I, we never say that the NSTs are dodging. But you know, one, I beg to differ in one aspect. That is, um, you asked for a rapid antigen test. The rapid antigen test is positive only in 53%. Remaining 47 cases, even if they are COVID positive, they come as negative. So how you are sure that when you are intubating a patient of a rapid antigen test negative is not truly COVID? So and I think it is, these tests won't do, sir. Actually, we have to exercise all the precautions and so, each and everyone should have a good personal protective equipment and we should be doing that. So you supply the good personal protective equipment <laughs> for everybody. Don't deny that. And, uh, and another thing is uh, these things, actually when it is a pandemic, uh, as a national director of health services, uh, former racial director of health service, I tell you not to do any tests. Presume everybody as positive and do it because it is a pandemic. Definitely uh, many, almost all the patients, unless proved otherwise, they are positive and we do it. It is the actual uh, uh, message I wanted to give to all the people, no, don't do any tests. And, but we want figures, we want figures. So that's why you people are doing, actually there is no need to do a, uh, a test in pandemic because most of the people are involved. And uh, in many of the cases, of course here is the deaths are more common. That's why we are doing all those things. But in case of uh, chikungunya and all, we, we didn't do any tests. We, when, when somebody complains of pain, okay, we, we treat it as a chikungunya. So uh, definitely it is there, but uh, you have to, impose some confidence on the people who are doing it. And don't say they, yeah. how they are responsible and why, why they are bothered and all. Don't say that. Uh, we are more bothered than the surgeon. Okay. No, I think uh, the point about doing a PCR is not a problem. I think uh, you can do it, and uh, um, but it will give you only a false sense of security because you still are at risk. Even if the tests are negative, you could still be at risk. I think my concern is insisting on pulmonary function tests and high resolution CT. That is no, not no, standard. No, 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 no. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, something that I would ask Dr. Chilimuri to speculate or Dr. Gudarazu to have any data. There's already in the public some concern about the impending coming third wave that will involve more children. I don't know what's the basis for it. Are you guys current on being able to answer that? Dr. Chilamuri first. Um, it's based on the observations in UK. Um, um, in UK, when the Delta variant came there, so they already had the, uh, their variant which subsided and the new one came in. It now, it turns out in the UK, uh, it has become the predominant, uh, the variant UK, the Delta variant. So it replaced their own variant uh, rather quickly, I think in less than three months. So in this way, uh, they observed two things. One is um, uh, more kids were infected than any other time. Uh, but they caution you into two uh, observations. One is maybe this variant uh, actually does infect children, maybe more. But uh, on the other hand, their schools were open. Uh, so schools were open, kids were not vaccinated. Whereas on the other hand, the adults were vaccinated. Uh, so therefore the only vulnerable group that were exposed to this Delta variant in UK was kids. And so therefore it was not a surprise that lots of kids, uh, kids in UK got infected. Um, I don't know as any signs saying that this virus, this particular variant targets children. I don't think that evidence is there. It's just as they were the vulnerable group left and the schools were open. That's why I think they saw more of that. Uh, which, if we, which may end up being the same situation in India because your colleges and schools are planning to open um, and, and you haven't uh, vaccinated kids. Um, so it may end up uh, being the same thing in the next wave. More of children could end up being exposed. That's possible. 
Dr. Budhrazu, what are you hearing from your meetings with the government crowd? So from what I'm hearing uh, across the country, I mean, there's no concrete data to suggest that uh, the next surge is going to predominantly involve kids. Uh, in countries like U.S., it's a function of the population that's vaccinated right now. The lowest uh, vaccination rates are in kids below, below 18. So we're expecting uh, higher numbers in terms of percentages of kids getting infected as a function of vaccination status, number one. Number two, in India, during the recent surge, um, there has been a lot of young parents, 30s, 40s, getting infected. And so as an extension of that, uh, there, you know, there's speculation. It is purely speculation at this point. There's no concrete data to suggest that, um, you know, that's going to be true. Uh, true. But on the other side, you know, that has given us an excuse to actually uh, prepare the health system for a potential surge in, in infections in the children. So unlike the recent surge, I think the country is probably going to be much more well prepared for if uh, the pediatric healthcare system is overwhelmed. There's less likelihood of that happening, I think, because of our recent experience with this surge. But I had a couple of questions for Prem Kumar. I have three patients now. One of them is on 15 liters of oxygen, you know, four weeks into hospitalization. Um, another one is on NIV at about 50% FiO2, about four weeks after, you know, uh, being in the ICU, not able to get her off the NIV. Um, and so there's a significant number of these patients, and I'm hearing that about a third of patients who recover from the ICU are going to end up as respiratory cripples. Number one, how do we deal with this population, which is significant numbers right now in India, in terms of medically managing them, any interventions? Number two, is, is the health system there actually talking about what we call LTAX that we have in U.S., like long-term acute care or pulmonary rehab? Um, the facilities, I think um, there's going to be a need for that. There's a significant number of people are going to be respiratory cripples. I don't know if Dr. Prem Kumar can answer that and maybe Dr. Sudhakar can chin too on that. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Dr. Badraz. Actually, yesterday I happened to visit the Medicare Hospital where I was stunned to see a big ward just like an industry, all of them are, you know, after four weeks, all are on oxygens, NAVs, all those things. I was really stunned to see such a huge number, roughly around 60. So, as you said, we are counting on deaths. So if, and living like a respiratory cripple is more than a death. I have observed in the first wave, so many people who were discharged with home oxygen with the help of an oxygen concentrator. And they used to visit me every month. And uh, most of them were off of the oxygen by third month. And, but they are still used to experience the symptoms of breathlessness on exertion. And I, I have a few people, at least my practice, I have a few, few people, even on the eighth month, they are not okay. They are on home HFNC and navies and all. A few people who could afford, they purchased A40. A40 is a small home ventilator by Philips Respironix. And uh, likewise, uh, you know, Stella too is a ResMed company, this small ventilator is costing up to 2, 2.7 lakhs. And they have their own oxygen facility at home. And they're living like that and probably they would go for a transplant. But you know, all the people can't afford, all the people can't afford oxygen concentrators are these A40 home ventilators. So definitely I fully agree that there should be a facility from the government side for the long haulers. I agree with you. Um, was there another question buried in that last question? I'm trying to see. Yeah, I wanted to ask Dr. Sudhakar if, uh... Um, for example, KGH is planning on a unit for uh, uh, respiratory rehab for people who are, you know, crippled and need some pulmonary rehab long term. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Budraj, for pointing it out. Uh, I think um, if you look at uh, the way we have been administering the oxygen and we have been talking all these days, 
that oxygen should be administered as a drug. Is it probably the, the reason for this is perhaps uh, uh, we not concentrating more on weaning uh, these patients at uh, the appropriate time, uh, making them more dependent on the oxygen is a question that needs to be addressed. Uh, with regards to the second one, I think we have an hospital for um, pulmonary diseases, the chest hospital. Perhaps we have to plan this on a long-term uh, basis. Now that we have an infectious diseases wing over there, maybe we have to think of that being converted into a, a place where you can take care of these patients who would require long-term care. Uh, it's a good thought. Probably we will uh, think over that and uh, going through the numbers and number of people who are requiring this, uh, perhaps we can go forward and uh, make a, a particular place suitable for this so that we can start this if necessary. Uh, sure, uh, that is a good idea and uh, we will have a thought on that. We have gone beyond 95 minutes. Dr. Sudhakar, it's back to you. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. Sir, uh, last but not the least, I thank Dr. Sudhakar for giving me this opportunity all through unstinted support. And I file in my duties if I don't thank all the other learned panel members, Chilimuri, Dr. Kairam, Budrazu, and uh, all others. And uh, I shouldn't forget to thank my cardiologist friend, Dr. PVV and M. Kumar who stimulates me to learn all through, and he's also a COVID expert, he's, even though he's a cardiologist. And next time when you think of panels, I think he would be a right person to be on the panel too. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Sudhakar, and thank you all. <laughs> See you Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. On, on, yeah, yeah. On, on behalf of all of us, and on behalf of Dr. Sudhakar, even though she's not present tonight, I will separately call and thank Dr. Kalpalata Guntupalli tomorrow for what she has done for this panel, for providing 13 or 12 different speakers, people that had a lot of experience and knowledge in the COVID management. It was very nice of her, even though she's not an AMC graduate. I will call her tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Sudhakar. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ramohan, uh, for an excellent uh, series that we had, 31 uh, in a row. And people have been saying thank you and as if they are bidding farewell, but it's not so. Uh, please do remember that we are going to continue this particular activity. And we'll get back to our Sunday sessions, but the only difference is that we are going to have this, uh, like what we have now, the timing, evening for you and morning for us. We'll have that on uh, Saturday. Um, we'll have Sunday morning so that you'll have uh, uh, that on uh, Sunday morning is um, Saturday night for you. So we will have that from this Sunday onwards. And for this series of 31, uh, the Expert Desk series that you have uh, coined, I'm very thankful to you uh, for uh, taking a lot of pains in getting all the excellent speakers. Both uh, Dr. Kalpalata Guntupalli and Sridhar Chilamuri have contributed enormously for this particular session. Sridhar particularly not only uh, taking many sessions, but uh, he has uh, identified appropriate speakers on various subjects, uh, like, like Dr. Uh, Muhammad Adrish. Uh, so we have had an excellent speakers during this particular uh, session of uh, 31, series of 31. And with this, we have uh, completed almost 72. And uh, we are going to have from Sunday onwards at the same time, because this appears to be more convenient both for you as well as for us. There are more number of people who are logging in at this time, 6.30 in the morning in India. And um, once if required, maybe as people say that we'll have the third wave at all, if we require more uh, exchange of knowledge, Perhaps the time we will have uh, this expert is coming uh, to our rescue again. And I'm very glad to uh, see the post from many people that it has been useful for them and it has made a lot of change in their lives and in the lives of their patients. Uh, I'm very glad uh, that is the purpose with which this entire uh, discussion has been started. The entire process has been started. But the greatest, um, there are two important aspects that I observed in this. One is the regularity with which we meet. The second one is, um, 
the expertise uh, that we have then when all uh, the people are so uh, very informed and they made uh, uh, everybody learn a lot and more importantly the discussion is a beautiful aspect of this particular program uh, unlike the didactic lectures that we have in many of the other fora so that makes me very happy and i'm very glad that um, all of you have strived so hard particularly you have taken so much of pain in getting all these um, speakers as well as moderating the session something which uh, is very unique and i learned a lot and in fact i have um, uh followed you and uh, try to do the similar thing in the ap webinars also people are asking me to moderate the sessions in ap webinars uh, all that uh, credit goes to you uh, thank you all and uh, we will meet again on sunday morning india time and um, that will be saturday night for the final comments to dr kairam uh, before i say goodbye before i say goodbye and good night I must remind everybody when I go to New York next time to visit Caesar Chilimuri, he might hit me on my head. Why? I did not separately recognize him because about 13 years ago I started calling Andhra Medical College KGH Sister Hospital of Bronx, Lebanon. <laughs> so you are not getting any separate recognition. You are already one of them. Thank oh, you. I don't much. need one. <laughs> no, no, but you provided a lot of your staff. Yeah. and your time and a short notice you're always there and thank you very much this you made this very very um complete i think uh, the people of india are my bro my own brothers and sisters i i uh, owe my entire success to india and uh, i have to pay back in whatever way i can and this is an honor and a modest attempt to help are uh, people who made me who i am very nice good night everybody so night. see you all next week thank good you night all of you bye bye thank you prem good day thank you sir thank you sridhar thank you thank you sir